Okay, we're going to move on to getting medical histories and doing animals. So it's very much the same um, as doing for small animals, but we're going to cover some of the differences. Um, you're going to ask specific questions to obtain the relevant information. Keep information on an organized timeline. And once you have the history, uh, make sure that you have accuracy uh, of that information. Starts with identifying the person that's presenting the animal. The person presenting the animal may be the caretaker, but may not. So you want to establish that relationship and make sure that they have um, the ability to make decisions. Uh, if you don't have the owner present, you need that contact information. Some of these animals are, are uh, extremely expensive animals and have insurance on them, so you want to determine their insurance status. Signalment of the animal, as always, it's the first thing that you're going to find out. And I'll, I'll say that the signalment of the animal is, um, the, is the important thing that you first need to communicate to your doctor when you're uh, stating the case for the animal. Um, so this includes age, sex, breed, color, and reproductive se status, that's the same, but also the intended use of the animal. So that's what's different. So um, most large animals are kept for specific purposes, could be production, could be companion, as a companion animal, could be as a racing animal. Um, so we need to be aware of that. Their occup or could be as a breeding animal, and their occupation can be may predispose it to certain diseases or injuries. Um, you want to use proper terminology in the medical record because it is species specific. So we are going to look at individual history and the chief complaint, and we're going to get that before you begin the physical examination unless you have an emergency situation. If you do have an emergency situation, you want to evaluate and stabilize the animal before proceeding with details about the history, but you need, might need to get real quick history. So there are two major components for individual history, the history of the current problem and the general history of the animal. The history of the current problem is usually taken first and includes that client's chief complaint, which again, may not be the primary problem. You want to ask questions directed to that chief complaint, characterize the problem in terms of duration, progression, severity, and frequency, and direct questions on specific body systems affected by the current problem before you break into general history. Then we move on to including information on the animal before the development of the current problem. So their diet, exercise, preventive health maintenance, and reproductive status. This includes previous medical pr problems and surgical procedures and also vaccine and deworming status. Animals are often treated, um, especially large animals, uh, before the veterinarian is called. So your question is, will they tell you? Now, most large um, uh, animal practitioners, uh, large animal clients will tell you what they've done. Um, they, they do do a lot of their own treatments. Uh, an example is this picture here of bloaties. If you have an animal that is bloated uh, because of eating uh, too much of a uh, substance that causing fermentation in their intestinal tract, um, this is something that can help to ease that bloat. And so it's sold over the counter and people often use it. So we, But we need to know if it's been used and has it worked? When, when did they use it? It may change our treatment. Uh, herd health history. Um, large animals commonly share resources with large other large animals, so we need to know what's going on there. They often receive, receive vaccinations, deworming, and external parasite control as a group, so they should have a herd health record available to you. Uh, this is a picture of somebody just going down the line with a bucket of um, stuff, and there she is um, probably inseminating uh, cattle. Um, so we just need to be aware that that is going on. Um, you want to obtain uh, information on the size and the nature of the group or herd and information on their shared resources. So food, water, shelter facilities, pastures and pens. It can give you some clues as to what might be going on. For courses, um, physical examination uh, can range from a basic multi-system or a system-specific examination just based on the patient's problems. There are a couple of different, we can do a sick examination uh, if we're out there for a, uh, a well visit or a sick visit, or we might be doing an insurance examination, which could be routine required by insurance company before a horse can receive insurance coverage. And that can be, it depends on what the insurance um, company wants, but it can range from a basic physical examination to a thorough, in-depth examination of all body systems. 
Um, there's also something called a pre-purchase examination. Uh, because these are large ticket items, these are very expensive horses, often uh, horses are examined before the sale of an animal, and this is pretty common. Um, this is a legal transaction, and the seller and the buyer must be must both both be identified and the veterinarian as the vet, veterinarian veterinary technician um, the veterinarian is performing the examination to the buyer's best interest so the veterinarian is paid by the buyer um, to do an exam on the the um, seller's pet or uh, animal <clears throat> the scope of the examination is dictated by its intended use and estimated value um, so obviously the more active this animal is intended to be and the more valuable it is the more in-depth it's going to be it could be a simple physical examination or an in-depth um, examination with a lameness exam where they're examining every um, joint on every limb uh, to be sure there's no problem anywhere documentation of this and this is what the veterinary technician is typically there for is documentation is private and it should be considered sensitive material you would not want uh, to share this information with any future buyers this is this buyers information um, if the seller asks what the information showed it's up to the buyer to, to provide that information um, so there's a difference between all these different types of examinations and there are legal implications based on what kind of examination you're doing so you need to be clear about the examination so we're going to start by uh, determining what kind of examination it's going to be. Observe the animal from a distance um, before you try to restrain it. So in the stall or in the field, uh, you want a total picture of the horse and its environment. You want to note its attitude, alertness, and general and observe for lameness. Um, if food and water are available, you want to watch it eat. You want to watch it drink. You want, if you can, um, look at its um, the way it's chewing and the way it's swallowing. You want to note any other. Uh, you want to assess their temperament and presence or absence of pain. A painful horse can be a dangerous horse. Appropriate method of physical restraint. We do try to use um, least restraint possible but we need to be as safe as possible with these large animals so um, physical restraint is necessary um, for safety of the personnel and the horse um, if we have stocks available uh, those that is often the best way to restrain a horse chemical restraint may be needed as well so we, it's not unusual for us to sedate an animal uh, it's often a stand and calm as they're standing Equine physical examination um, starts with the TPR, um, just with as with any animal, so temperature, um, pulse, and respiration. With the body temperature, we take it rectally and use either a mercury or digital thermometer. They're typically, large animal tip, uh, thermometers are typically lo longer than normal. Um, it's uh, common that we have a uh, thicker glass than normal, so a large animal um, uh thermometer is different uh, so it's usually about five inches long and we usually there's a there's usually a hook at the end of it to tie a string to it we keep a string tied to the thermometer because if you stick a thermometer in there sometimes it gets sucked in there and it's hard to get out so they don't always they don't always poop it out it can stay in there for a long time so we keep string attached to it so that's a little bit different too horse temperature should be between 99 and 1015 and cattle temperature should be between 1015 and 103 after the TPR, and you, and you, you will listen or feel the pulse. Um, uh, there's a facial artery or a tail artery that you can feel the pulse with. Um, you can listen to the heart and the lungs. Um, you can watch them breathe. You're going to also listen in large animals to their abdomen. We do abdominal auscultation because um, they, their GI system, their working GI system is extremely important. So we need to listen to all four, all two sides, both sides in all four quadrants. So upper front, lower front, upper rear, lower rear. So all four sides on both, uh, all four areas on both sides. Uh, we use a stethoscope to listen just as with the heart and lungs so when you're listening with the stethoscope you're listening to the heart the lungs and the abdomen 
Um, you're going to determine hydration status. Uh, you're going to examine the mucous membranes and the capillary refill time. And then sometimes we'll do height and weight measurements. How do we do height and weight measurements? Um, we do that with horses because we need to know height. Um, that's important. Um, by measuring them on a flat surface. And then there are, uh, there are uh, measuring devices that we can use. Um, we can and we measure them. Horses are measured by hands. Uh, the unit measurement is hands, and each hand is about four inches. Um, weight measurements can be estimated by using a measuring tape that goes around um, the chest of an of a horse, uh, but more accurately is being is done on a scale. All right. So heart rate versus pulse rate um, in normal rate animals, the heart rate and the pulse rate are equal. They won't always happen at exactly the same time. They're larger animals. It takes longer for the, the blood to go through the system. As the heart is auscultated, if you can reach the arterial pulse, which is just under the mandible, and it's a large vessel right under the mandible, you stick your hand underneath the mandible on the inside and you can feel it, um, you want to try to um, listen and feel at the same time. Every heartbeat should be accompanied by a palpable pulse wave. Now the the pulse rate and heart rate of a horse and a cow are very slow. So 20 to 40 beats per minute means you're going to be sitting there for a while listening for a heart rate. So you need to understand that how long you're going to be standing there listening for the heart rate. Respiration is characterized by both effort and depth uh, and rate. Um, so inspiration or expiration, remember there's a difference between the diseases. If we have an inspiratory disease versus an expiratory disease, meaning upper versus lower uh, diseases. Um, some descriptive terminology would be shallow breaths, deep breaths, labored breaths, or gasping. We're also listening for the normal respiratory quality. Um, there should be a combination of both thoracic and abdominal muscles to breathe in the horse. Um, and then if they have chest pain, that's going to change the, uh, they're going to increase their, their abdominal muscles in order to breathe. So if there's any pain in the chest. One of these uh, pictures here, there's a picture of the respiratory um, tract of the horse. Um, included in that are sinuses, including a guttural pouch that is an important part of the respiratory uh, tract of the horse uh, that is not in other animals. Also, I have a picture of the glottis here. The glottis is the opening to the trachea, includes vocal cords on either side. Occasionally, we'll have a paralyzed glottis, which will make the sound a horse sound as if it is roaring. We call this roarer's disease, and it is a paralyzed uh, uh, vocal cord, basically. So the heart is about the size of a large basketball. Um, it's, it's very large, it moves very slowly, and it is very deep sound. You can listen on either the left or right side, and this indicates where you should be listening. Um, these, these tape uh, lines are not normally found on the horse, but uh, you can visualize them on the horse. So here's the top of the shoulder and the bottom of the shoulder, and right behind, and here's the elbow here, and uh, right behind, I'm sorry, this is the bottom of the shoulder and the, and the uh, top of the um, Here's the uh, elbow right here, and this is where you're going to be listening uh, to the heart, right in this area here. Most heart valves are, uh, sounds are heard on the left side. Um, some murmurs are heard on the right. This, this is with most animals. I'm going to listen to both sides of the chest. Uh, so level of the shoulder joint for the heart base and the point of the elbow um, for the heart apex. So the heart base is up here. The apex of the heart is down here. It's located in a cranio to caudal position and it's uh, defined by the caudal border of the triceps. The triceps are right here um, and it roughly uh, divides the heart into cranial and caudal half. So you're not going to be able to hear the entire heart. With lung auscultation here, again, we have this convenient taped um, location of the lungs here. And uh, you're going to hear different things on the left and right side. There are different shapes of the lungs on the left and right side. Um, they're very large, um, and it's uh, you usually have a really uneven distribution of disease, so it's important to listen to this entire area here. Back here is where you're going to listen to the GI tract. 
So a stethoscope is used for abdominal sounds. You want to hear those sounds moving through the intestines. It's, it's called, called as, as we, we hear, hear sounds, sounds, it's called borborygmus, B-O-R-B. Uh, o R B O R B O R Bor Bor uh, Y G O M O U S. But uh, I think I've spelled that correctly. Borborygmus is the gas. It's um, what we refer to as gastrointestinal motility. It's air bubbles moving through liquid. So when you hear your stomach growl, that's what you're hearing. And we want to be able to hear that as it moves through the intestines of the um, horse in all four quadrants on both sides. Um, if a patient is colicking or has GI disease, we need to be able to listen for those. So um, we want to listen at any point. We should hear the borborygmus uh, or borborygmi. Um, uh, usually listening in the flank, which is the stitch. You can hear along the colon there. Um, it can be painful if it's distended with gas, so do be careful with that. So here is dividing it to, into um, halves. Here's the point of the hip. Here's the flank, upper, lower, upper, lower. So uh, upper, lower, flank, both sides. I'm making a big deal of this because it's really, really important. It's important. So here is borborygmi. Um, those are the intestinal motility sounds. It can sound like thunder rumbling or an approaching freight train. Um, and they're usually associated with a large intestinal motility, although we can associate with sm some small intestine. Evaluating the mucous membranes, also important in the horse. Um, these are the mucous membranes. It can be the gum tissue here, or it could be the uh, vulvar tissue around the, the female or the, around the penile tissue around, in the uh, penis and the sheath of the uh, prepuce. Uh, can help us to um, with um, diagnosis of disease. Um, could be the conjunctiva of the eye or the lining of the nostrils as well. Want to make sure that they are secreting mucus, that they're not dry and tacky, but they're nice and moist. Um, and uh, we want to be able to press on it and get a CRT value and it should be less than two seconds. Um, icterus is uh, when we have a, a yellowing of the um, gingival tissue or the mucous membrane tissue. It can also be the inner surface of the ear. We can see it there because it's pretty thin skin. That indicates that we have a liver disease or a clotting disorder. Um, also, if we see little tiny pinpoint um, bruising, um, w that also indicates a clotting disorder. So a hydration status, uh, we can do this with small animals as well, um, but it helps us with a subjective um, indication of their hydration status. Uh, we can do phys uh, laboratory tests as well to, to um, help us with this, but this is a skin turgor test. If we pinch the skin and the skin doesn't um, stretch right back into position, that means they're dehydrated. Um, if you pinch the skin and it goes right, snaps right back into position, that they're, they're probably not dehydrated or not very dehydrated. We're also going to touch the mucous membranes and make sure that we have a capillary refill time. Uh, the CRT reflects a cardiac output, um, and if we have a prolonged CRT, and it's affected by hydration status, um, but if we have a prolonged CRT, that means we have low cardiac output, which can be inadequate hydration or decreased heart function. Here's an estimate of the height using a tape measure to go from a, a flat surface here to the, from the base of the hoof all the way to the top of the withers. This is These are the withers, and we need to go to the top, and one hand equals four inches, and then we can also do a weight measurement by um, doing the, the um, a tape around, and that the, on the other side of the tape, there's a um, uh, rough estimation for weight measurement. Precise determination of height is uh, done by a commercially made rigid ruler. Um, they're made of metal, so they're, they're less likely to break or bend. Um, and they include bubble style levels to make sure that the ru ruler is not tilted, so you get an accurate measurement. Here's the weight measurement. This is on the side of the weight tape, weight and height tape. Um, it helps us if we don't have a scale, we can get an estimate for drug dosages and to formulate a diet. Um, this is a livestock scale. Uh, this would be for shorter livestock, um, or we could open that up to get a horse in there. But uh, we can put them in the scale and have, have them stand there. 
Ruminants. Again, we begin with initial visual observation of animal from a distance. We want to note posture, behavior, body condition, and alertness. Note specifics such as breathing pattern, respiratory noise, lameness, skin wounds, and muscle atrophy. Muscle atrophy is the wasting away of muscles. TPR, um, so temperature, pulse, and respirations, heart and lung auscultation, abdominal auscultation, assessment of rumen function, that's a little bit different. They have uh, four stomachs, and the first one is the rumen, and the rumen is super, super important for them to function normally. Also, assessment of hydration status, examination of mucous membranes, uh, and then, you know, obviously we need to do use restraint typically for examination of these large animals. Uh, temperatures taken the same way as horses. For a pulse, we're going to try for a facial um, or a coccygeal, which is underneath the tail. We can use median or great metatarsal arteries um, as well. We can use a femoral artery in the smaller sheep and goats, just like with the smaller um, dogs or cats. Respiratory rates, we want to count from a, a distance uh, before we start to handle them. Ruminants are capable of open mouth breathing, uh, but it's usually considered a sign of distress or heat stress. Um, abdominal breathing, they should use their abdominal muscles. Uh, in That's normal in ruminants, not normal in horses. Um, heart, we're going to use the same uh, landmarks as, as horses, so behind the elbow and just up a little bit. Lung auscultation starting from rib number five back to rib number 11. And you'll learn this, but they have 18 ribs. Um, so it goes back a little further. Um, if we need to induce deep breathing in order to listen to them to a uh, full breath, we can hold their nostrils and mouth shut for about a minute. And that will cause them to take a really big breath, obviously. Mucous membrane should be pink and moist, and the capillary refill time should be about one to two seconds. Uh, we want to open the mouth for examination as well, and to do that with any animal, they have a space between their ca um, canines or their back teeth and their incisors, and we can just push down on that space and open up their mouth in order to take a look um, at their uh mouth. We, with horses and um, cows, we can grasp the tongue and bring it over to the side of the mouth. Uh, that will keep the mouth open because they won't want to bite down on their tongue. The cattle tongue is unique. It's very long and it's uh, prehensile. They can use it to grasp things um, like, like uh, chunks of of uh, stalks of corn or whatever. Um, there is an anatomical feature in it that's often mistaken for a laceration. This is normal. There's a transverse groove here. Um, and you have to just realize that that is normal. I have this, uh, tongue, the cow tongue is known as a, a um, delicacy a, in, in this country. Um, I personally don't like it, but uh, some people really like it. So I do have this out on a plate so you can see that transverse groove. That is normal. Um, they have lower incisors, but not upper incisors. They have an up uh, dental pad on their upper uh, palate, so that there's no there's no way they can bring incisors down together. But they do have molars that can be sharp and jagged, so you have to be really careful that they don't uh, cut you with their teeth uh, if you put their, your hand in their mouth. So um, they have a rumen, and that rumen ferments the grass uh, that they eat. In order when it when you have fermentation, you have a lot of gas formed, and so with that gas formed, it, they need to eructate. They burp up um, material from their rumen, and that's normal. Okay, so we should see eructation. Uh, kind of a low-pitched fluttering sound, and they should eructate uh, for cattle and goats 10 times an hour um, to bring contents from their rumen up to their mouth. They will chew their cud, and then they will swallow that back down, and that will go through the rest of their intestinal tract. So the, there needs to be contractions going on in the rumen. Um, the rumen is on the left side of the animal. Um, most of that left side of the animal is all rumen, um, and that the contractions uh, should be counted. It should be contracting normally. If it's if it's not contracting, it's not moving things around much. It means it's bloated. So we want to count the rumen contractions. You'll 
stick your uh, stethoscope like pretty press it per pretty firmly in right behind the rib cage and you'll listen it'll sound like a freight train coming at you um, you'll hear it gradually approaching the stethoscope and then going away um, another way to feel it is to um, what we call ballotment is when you palpate you put both fists in the cow or one fist or one hand in the uh, in the um, uh, goat or the sheep and you're going to feel that actually come to you so we call this the paralumbar fossa so paralumbar below the lumbar spine fossa means hole um, or depression and uh, you're going to leave it there for one minute and count the contractions so you should have one to two contractions per minute when we have a problem, uh, the stomach, the rumen is not contracting, they're not erectating, there's more gas being produced than they can get out. We call that bloat or tympany. It's called tympany because if you, if you ping it or you um, percuss it, it sounds like a drum. What you'll see is an enlargement of this left paralumbar fossa, so that divot won't be there anymore. It'll be blown out a little bit. We call this shape a papal shape. It looks like an apple on this side and a pear on this side. So apple, pear, pear, apple, papal. Um, and it'll always be left side apple, right side pear. And this is a major issue. If they have bloat, we need to fix this. So this is what it looks like normally. This is abnormal. So normal pear shape. So the rumen should be down here. It shouldn't have gas up here. Um, I do have a video on an abdominal examination here, and I have pulled that out in your eLearn course shell. I definitely recommend that you listen, or watch and listen to it. Um, you want to listen for gas accumulations we can percuss and auscultate at the same time this is oh, going to show this woman doing this um, it's called abdominal pinging what we do is we hold the stethoscope in place and then um, ping flick at the side of the animal and we're listening for a pinging sound now if you were to ping a say a volleyball versus a basketball you would hear different sounds based on the size of the the volume of the air that's within that tight structure and that's kind of what we're listening for we're also looking at the character of the feces of uh, animals so you need to understand what is normal so um, horses will have normally shaped um, round basically uh, if it looks like this that's abnormal the, these are goat pellets that's normal if it looks like this it's abnormal but this is perfectly normal for a cattle cattle defecate 12 to 18 times a day that's a lot of manure they have a semi-solid consistency and not not any distinct form goats will have well sh sh uh, formed feces in the shape of small cell solid pellets and sheep will be the same the color of the feces is going to depend on the diet so it's going to be anywhere from green to dark brown i know this time of year my horses are out on pasture um, and it's been with when they first go out it's pretty rich pasture and so they get a little bit loose but their um, feces definitely turns green it gets brown when they're eating hay and green when they're eating grass if you have any questions about this large animal physical um, examination, please shoot me an email or ask your instructor. Um, we're happy to um, uh, tell you about it. You will be at some point um, performing a physical examination on a large animal. So it's important that you go through this and you understand it. You're able to visualize yourself doing these uh, things.